So welcome everyone. Um, I see folks are joining. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, I'll give a few seconds for the participants um, to join and for us to give instructions on language interpretation. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm just giving folks a few seconds to join um, as people keep trickling in. Um, okay, I think I think this is good. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to meeting number 13 of the Environmental Justice um, Council. My name is Maria Belen Power, and I'm the Undersecretary of Environmental Justice and Equity for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And before we get started, um, there are some Zoom technical instructions and technical points to go over. And so I'll turn it to our amazing team at ERG and Kessel John. Thank you, every, uh, everyone, for joining us. And I have some logistics. So first of all, we are offering 10 verbal languages and ASL. You can use. Kelsey, you're breaking up a little bit. And the slides um, just went. Um, Apologies, let me reshare. <laughs> cool, thank you. All right, it's loading. There yep, we go. I think you're good now. Wonderful. So people who are speaking English, please select the English channel so you'd be able to hear any translated comments. Um, anyone else, you should be able to select your channel by clicking on the globe icon at the um, bottom of your Zoom control panel. If you're making any verbal comments today and uh, our council members, this applies to you as well, please speak slowly so our interpreters can keep up. If you are deaf or hard of hearing, please raise your hand and put a comment in the chat or Q&A box and we can promote you to a panelist so you will be able to communicate with our ASL interpreters. Audio is available through your computer's speakers or by telephone. To switch to phone audio, click the, on the upward arrow next to the audio option, select switch to phone audio, and follow the instructions provided. Please put any questions you would like addressed by the council into the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand. Use the chat box for Zoom technical difficulties, or you can email meetings at erg.com with any logistical questions. Closed caption will be auto-generated, and you can turn that on by clicking on the CC icon in your Zoom control panel. Also, just so everyone knows, this meeting is being recorded. A link with the information and documents used in this meeting, including slides and the agenda, will be dropped into the chat. I would also like to remind council members that they should not use the Zoom chat for anything other than, than logistics. The audience does not have access to the chat, and the discussion needs to happen in public view. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Maria, Maria Belen. Thank you, Kessel. Um, so now we're going, if we could go to the next slide, we are going to go over the agenda. Um, so uh, we will have roll call and um, approval of the minutes from our last meeting. We will have a, a period for question and comments at the very beginning of the meeting. Um, and response to comments where appropriate. And then we will have a discussion of the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. The council has, um, has heard a presentation before, and this is a follow-up to that. Um, and um, then we'll have EJC updates um, and a, a second portion of question and comments from the public and again, response um, and answers when appropriate. And then we will um, go to next steps and adjourn. Um, so let me do um, roll call uh, for the Environmental Justice um, Council members. Um, 
Kalila Barnett. I don't think she, Kalila's here. Madeline. Melissa Ferretti. Cheryl Holly. Here. Caroline Hahn. Here. Namrita Kapoor. Here. Lydia Lowe. Here. Marcos Luna. Here. Peter Mathy. Here. And I am Maria Orlan Power. Sophia Owen is not here. Jen Salinetti. Here. Patricia Spence. Here. Ari Zorn. Oh, Ari is not here. Um, and Miles Gresham. Here. Great. Thank you all. And thank you for joining. I know we, um, we've we been meeting every two months, but this meeting is a um, special meeting for the uh, Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. So really appreciate folks um, hopping on. Um, and so now we can go to the next, oh no, sorry, we're doing the minutes. Um, so we will, if I can get a motion to approve the minutes from January 11th meeting that happened, um, hybrid in, in MASHP. If someone could motion to approve the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes from the January 11th meeting. Thank you, Peter. Can I get a second? Pat Spence seconds the motion. Thank you, Pat. Um, any discussion? Great. Um, all in favor, say aye or raise. I guess I think it would be better if you raise your hand, either physically your actual hand or your virtual hand. And if um, I could, I could call out who has their hand up, Kessel, if that's helpful. Yes, that would be great. So keep your hands up, please. So Caroline Hahn, uh, Lydia Lowe, Marcos Luna is abstaining because he was not there. Lydia, you had your hand up, right? Yes. Um, and then Pat Spence, Peter, Miles, are you, did you raise your hand or no? I am staying. I wasn't there. Okay. So Miles is abstaining. Jen Salinetti is abstaining. Um, Cheryl's hand is up as well. And I believe that's it. Um, the, I think the rest of the participants are the interpreters. Um, uh, I think Namrita is raising her hand. I'm not sure if you got her. Yes, I am. I, I couldn't oh, tell whether it, was, it got raised or not. I did not see her. Thank you. Yep, so Namrita. Um, anyone opposed? And I think the two abstentions were Marcos and Miles. Is that right? Great. So the motion passes, the minutes are approved. Um, so now we go to question and comments from the public. Um, you can raise the public, the folks who have joined us um, on the virtual meeting can raise your hand and Kessel from ERG will give you the ability to unmute yourself and you, um, if you would like to make a verbal comment, you can also make comments um, both both verbally and um, in the chat in different languages that we are offering today. Um, once you are unmuted, simply begin to speak and the interpreter will translate your words into English, into folks who chose the English room. Um, and this is also a good reminder for folks that are not using an interpreter to select English room. Um, by clicking on the interpretation icon, the globe um, icon at the bottom of your screen and clicking English. This way you will be able to hear any translated comments. Um, and please, uh, for folks in the public uh, joining us and wanting to make a comment, please limit your comments to um, two minutes per speaker. And if folks wanna write their comments in the chat, please type them in, in the, sorry, in the Q&A box, not the chat. And Kessel will read them out loud for, out loud for us. Um, 
And again, another reminder for the council members to avoid using the chat as all discussions have to happen in the public view. Um, as well as just reminder of the council members to keep their responses brief if we do, um, if we are able to go into response to questions or comments. So Kessel, I'll hand it to you if you can help me facilitate the questions. Great, thank you. Uh, we have one person with their hand up, Catherine. Uh, Catherine, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I was at the last meeting in Brockton and that was great. I brought a couple of my neighbors. I have a question. When you have those meetings out in cities or towns, do you invite anybody from the, the town, the city or town itself so that they know or no? Yeah. Um, so why don't we listen to all the comments and questions and then I can answer your, Thank your you. question if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else, Kessel? Uh, nobody has raised their hand and there are no questions in the Q&A box. Great, so the, um, to answer your question, Ms. Rodriguez, there, um, if for the Brockton meeting, we do, and actually for the other meetings we have as well, contact the, the municipality as well as the state representative. So I don't know if you um, remember that state rep, um, Michelle Dubois was there and she gave a few welcoming remarks as well as um, a comment during the public comment portion of the meeting and um, the municipality was um, invited and aware of the meeting. Actually, at one point it was an option to host it at the at City Hall, but we um, that ended up not being the case, but they did know and were invited to the meeting. And if folks who want to submit questions afterwards, they are also welcome to do that. And you can um, you can email meetings at erg.com. And um, there is also a link. Kessel, I don't know if we can put the link in the Q&A chat for folks to submit questions if they have questions they want to put in writing. Mm -hmm. We can put that in the chat. Great. Thank you. So now we will go over, um, I will invite my colleagues at the governor's office, at the Office of Climate and Resilience. Um, and we are joined today by Jonathan Trag. Jonathan, I, I believe your title is Deputy um, Climate Chief. And we are also joined by his colleague, um, Diana Jade. So I will pass it over. And I, I believe Chief Hoffer is not here, right? Um, John. That is correct. She sends her regrets. Thank you, Undersecretary. Great. So I'll pass it to you, Jonathan, um, and, and our colleagues at ERG will share slides for us. Um, so over to you, Jonathan. Thanks so much. Diana's going to do most of the talking. She's done most of the work. I just want to say hello to everyone and thank you all for gathering for this special meeting. We are operating under a um, EPA deadline. And so we're very grateful for your time in the evening and for your engagement. Before Diana gets stuck into it, I want to just highlight some of the engagement that we've had focused on environmental justice issues and under the terms of this federal grant, what the US EPA calls low income and disadvantaged communities, which is their term. Um, Working backwards in time, we've had held two special meetings, um, February 1 and February 2, that were relatively formal and translated in multiple languages with invitations out to over 600 people, over 100 participants. We met four times in October, November, December, and January with the Justice 40 and Equitable Investment Group that Under Secretary Power has convened which brings together between 30 and 40 environmental justice uh, organizations uh, to talk about the same material, at different points of development, as we'll talk about tonight. We held a call with um, 25 gateway cities, uh, sustainability or mayor's office officials to talk about the program and get their perspective. Um, we reached out to areas that are of particular importance 
because of the geography of the state and, and other aspects of this grant, in particular, the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. We had two meetings with their staff. We've held monthly meetings with a collection of trade unions, um, both the Boston Building Trades, Darlene Lombos, and also the Massachusetts Building Trades, IBEW, AFL-CIO. And we held individual meetings with advocates in, in the environmental justice space on particular issues of interest to them. Um, just a handful, uh, Greg King, uh, Browning the Green Space, Groundwork Lawrence, Mary Wambui, Boston Green New Deal um, on various topics related to energy burden and environmental burden to help inform our work. I would say that in a broad way, this work has been transformative for how we think about and plan our investment and our approach to climate. It has genuinely centered a focus on environmental justice and the benefits to environmental justice, low-income disadvantaged communities. You'll hear more about that as we get into our implementation grants, but I think this is really an important uh, change that has worked hand in glove with all the work that Undersecretary Power is doing at the state level. So with that as preface, let me turn it over to my colleague, Diana Jay, who will talk about the Priority Climate Action Plan that is due March 1st, and then we'll get into the implementation grants. Diana? Great, thank you, Jonathan, and hi, everyone. And this is my first time joining the Environmental Justice Council meeting, so I'm really glad to be here. And yeah, I will first start with just recapping an overview of what is the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. I think if you can go forward two slides, probably. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I know some people have heard this before, but um, to make sure we're on the same page, uh, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant is a three-phase program administered by US EPA, and we're currently in the first phase, uh, I'd say first and entering the second at the same time. Um, so the first phase is a prioritized planning push to identify near-term, high-priority, implementation-ready measures that both maximize greenhouse gas reduction while also advancing benefits and equity across the state. And we're required in this stage to produce a prioritized climate action plan, which we call the PCAP, the PCAP, uh, and that's due on March 1st. Uh, following the PCAP, we then submit funding applications to move forward and implement a handful of priorities out of that priority plan. And by late spring, we're gonna begin phase three, which is the comprehensive planning phase. And this is really an opportunity for a much deeper planning process, a comprehensive planning process that covers all actions that we are doing across the state to address climate change uh, and engage the communities across the state. So we, as, as Jonathan said, we're in this kind of sprint right now with uh, the deadline of March 1st uh, to get the report to EPA. And we're really excited to share it with you after uh, many conversations and work. So that's what we'll be covering mostly today um, is, is this what is in the draft report and, and hearing feedback and also our ideas and proposals right now for the implementation grants. So for the next slide, uh, the CPRG is guided by these three main goals from US EPA, which is first to maximize greenhouse gas reduction, as Jonathan said, um, the second goal is uh, alongside of the Federal Justice 40 initiative um, that overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities, uh, including those overburdened by pollution. So this is a major goal driving uh, where, where the funding will move for the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant and the, the direction of the planning process is the benefits to low income and disadvantaged communities. And lastly, the, the third goal is to move forward policies and programs that are replicable and can be scaled up beyond this point with a transformative impact. And next slide. Um, great. So we, uh, I'm going to talk through nine priority climate action measures, which are the substance of this plan. And uh, to, to frame that, we uh, are focusing on the sectors that emit the largest amount of greenhouse gases in the state uh, because of the nature of this being the prioritized plan. So we're gonna focus primarily on transportation, buildings and power for that reason, for that they generate the greatest amount of climate pollution. 
And as I mentioned, we will then broaden to the full, um, to all aspects of the state and the economy in the comprehensive planning phase. So I wanna start first with transportation. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so our first priority measure here is uh, in the transportation sector, we have three measures. The first is to adopt uh, zero or low emission medium heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and this is uh, a measure that's focused on transit vans, delivery vans, trucks, school buses, uh, heavy duty transit buses, and aims to increase the adoption through vehicle incentives, charging infrastructure support, and technical assistance. Uh, the second measure in the plan is to adopt zero or low emission light duty vehicles, passenger vehicles. Uh, right now, light duty vehicles make up the bulk of transportation emissions in our state. So through rebates, procurement, and charging infrastructure development, we aim to rapidly accelerate uh, the transition to zero emission vehicles. The third priority action uh, measure is to increase alternatives to personal vehicle travel, which is often called mode shift. And in this category, we have uh, two prioritized projects. So the first is to increase uh, short distance transportation alternatives. So we're looking at increasing uh, e-bikes, uh, passenger van services, as well as safe road and trail infrastructure to support this travel. And secondly, this measure focuses on expanding rail service and electrifying rail service. Uh, so including rapid transit, commuter rail, and particularly uh, accelerating the implementation of West-East rail through investing in rail, sta rail station upgrades. Uh, next slide. Um, so the next set of measures will be in the building sector. Uh, we're looking first uh, as buildings after transportation are the largest source of climate pollution from heating, cooling, and powering our buildings. And again, we have three measures here. So the first is to increase building efficiency, which uh, looks at commercial buildings, residential housing, and schools. And in this measure, we're looking at retrofits to improve the enclosure and envelope through better insulation and to reduce energy use of our buildings. Uh, this is also a measure where we can add in a lot more engagement um, pairing alongside retrofits. So part of how we think about working in buildings and particularly working in schools is by doing school retrofit projects, we also will pair energy efficiency with cur curriculum engagement and community engagement uh, to utilize schools as a place for public gathering and um, education to increase awareness and, and um, yeah, engagement with decarbonization and climate change at the state. So the second measure here is to decarbonize building heating systems. This measure aims to increase the availability and uh, services for low carbon heating systems, particularly air source heat pump adoption, and to do so by supporting the supply chain for available and affordable heat pumps uh, to replace gas heating and oil heating uh, and to also invest in the workforce that's needed to accelerate this work across the state for installation. Um, secondly, this also includes expanding geothermal heating. So this is for larger scale clean heat systems at residential and commercial buildings. And third, the uh, in addition to building energy efficiency and clean heat, the third measure here is to implement building scale renewables. So this is including rooftop solar, local wind, ground mount solar, uh, and saying that we should be, yeah, as we're pairing retrofits and heating system replacements, also adding uh, the renewable energy onto the buildings in which we work. So that's the building sector. You can go to the next slide. Great, thank you. Uh, so this will be the third area, the power sector. We have two priority measures. Diana, I'm sorry to- Yes, am I going too fast? No, no, no. I'm... Um, I'm wondering if if we can pause and see if there are questions okay. from the council members or if we should just keep going. I'm just, I'm just posing this question to the council. If folks have questions or if we should keep going. Okay, maybe we can keep going. Thanks, Diana. Okay, great. We are eager to discuss, so you... Mm -hmm. Feel free to to pause me, and um, though I am eager to hear have Jonathan talk about our funding applications too, uh, which is where we uh, also really want input. So I'll keep going. Um, on the power sector, we have two priority measures. 
Uh, the first is to develop new renewable energy facilities. Uh, and we're particularly looking at accelerating offshore wind development uh, by way of investing in port infrastructure in order to open up new offshore wind areas such as the Gulf of Maine, uh, as well as secondly, to increase utility scale and community scale, scale solar development uh, through technical assistance uh, and incentives. Secondly, the next priority measure is to maximize the utilization of clean energy, uh, which means increasing the efficient use of all the energy that we have, uh, as well as the new clean energy onto the grid. Uh, in this area, we're looking at two priority projects, including first, the development of municipal microgrids that increase resilience, and to do so by providing municipal leaders with the technical and financial assistance uh, to develop energy resilience hubs and assets particularly looking at critical uh, public facilities such as uh, community centers, as well as hospitals. And secondly, in this measure, we are also focusing on electric grid investments to target inefficient operations that will result in the reduction of loss of power through distribution and transmission systems. And go to the next slide. This will be our last measure of the nine. So the last measure is to uh, enhance carbon sequestration solutions uh, and this is a measure that can also pair with many of the measures that have been uh, discussed before, so such as pairing with the buildings, uh, the work on buildings, but uh, this measure aims to enhance carbon sequestration in natural and working lands uh, by forestry restoration and preservation and to increase tree, shrub, and grass planting projects in urban areas. And you can go to the next slide. So to put more context to what uh, Jonathan opened with uh, and, and the goals that I mentioned for this, this grant program from US EPA uh, is that uh, US EPA um, has uh, yeah, mandates and encourages benefits for this program to flow first to low-income and disadvantaged communities, which is a federal federally defined term uh, that is uh, yeah, defined by um, communities who experience high burden, uh, the highest ranking burden over areas of climate change, energy, health, housing, pollution, transportation, water and wastewater, workforce development, and income. And it's, it's the goal of this program, which are the communities that are defined federally as low-income and disadvantaged communities are the ones that are marked in green on this map. And the goal of this program is to design programs that actually target the benefits first to, to these communities. So we're also doing in this project additional analysis and additional mapping uh, through where, how are these burdens experienced across our state and how can program design um, move benefits first to those communities. So for example, we're, and we're developing some additional maps that we haven't, uh, didn't have ready in time for this presentation, but we're mapping you know, increased highway transit and where there's the highest concentration of um, medium heavy duty transit that results in um, yeah, emissions from, from trucks, uh, such as including at warehouses and airports, and that is informing how we're moving forward on uh, these, these programs. So you can go to the next slide, actually. Okay, actually, I thought there was one more slide, but that is okay. I think, Jonathan, I'm going to hand it over to you, and we're going to talk about implementation grants. So... Let's just pause there, following Maria Belen's cue. Any questions from the council? Okay. Oh, sorry. This is. Sorry. I think we have a few questions. Just want to right. check. Um, sorry. This is this is Caroline Hahn. I just had a question on the um, on the building um, building sector and geothermal in particular, which you know I think is 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 fantastic to see there in terms of thinking of how we're potentially using more efficient technologies and deploying those. Um, it, you mentioned with um, air source heat pump procurement and um, and and deployment that there's a focus on the supply chain in, in particular, which I think it makes a ton of sense. I'm just wondering whether the same might also be the case when we're thinking about expanding geothermal given the limited number of um, you know, people and, and the limited workforce that's able to actually do this currently. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I think for geothermal, it's 
even more workforce than supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these measures should be thought of as a menu. This, the, the way this grant operates, the state has an obligation to develop a menu of measures. And that menu, the state can order off of and apply from, and so too can each of the RPAs and all of the municipalities. So as you'll hear in a moment, we the state does not anticipate doing a state application on geothermal, but we think that there may be a few municipalities that do, and we would encourage those municipalities to include a strong workforce element in to, to address that issue. Um, so I completely agree with you. We are closely in touch with Zainab um, and Audrey of the HEAT team. Um, we're closely watching the outcomes of 20-80, and that is part of why we included that measure to allow municipalities to apply and, and order off of that menu selection. Thank you. Okay. Anyone Are else? You? Sorry, Jonathan. Not at all. Uh, yes, I. This is Pat Patricia Spence. I did have my hand up. Yeah, feel uh, for folks, Pat um, and others. Feel free to just um, jump in and interrupt us. Okay. Um, I don't know the housing stock of Springfield and Worcester, but um, being from Dorchester, looking at the triple decker housing stock, is the when we're looking at increasing solar. Um, does that include a triple decker with a flat tar roof? I just, I'm not up to date on the technology. So um, I think it would, yes. Um, I think that um, the economics of an individual project may prove that like the larger warehouses mm -hmm. um, may be more cost effective for a single development or for a municipality to develop a program around. Um, but it would certainly, you know, from Dorchester, those kinds of roofs are certainly eligible. One other background criteria that's important for this grant is, um, are you filling an unmet need? Are there other funds that could be used? And for the situation that you described, I think the Solar for All program, um, addressing residential, uh, moderate and and low income housing, affordable housing, um, in the solar for all. You know, we have applied for two hundred and fifty million dollars in that program. We expect to get an answer next month. And so, I think when the state was evaluating options, one reason why we may not have prioritized that was because we knew we had a solar for all application. Uh, before EPA, and it would be sort of double dipping, if you will. So that, in... that, that makes sense. And just a, the second question, this is very vague, but is there a need for, in any of what you just presented, is there a need for infrastructure security? I think I'm thinking of cybersecurity, all of, all of those mm, things. Mm. Some of these projects, I don't know if this applies or not. No, it does. You're absolutely right. It feels it's, like it applies to everything that, that's going on these days. Well, it probably applies to our meeting right now. Um, so I think the answer is yes, both cybersecurity, physical security, and more practically, electric grid modernization yes. upgrades. That's what I'm thinking. Um, Undersecretary Power has you know whole teams of people that work with her who are focused on that. One of, you know, when we consulted with them and conferred closely on that, first, those, so much of these are about electrification. So much of the state's decarb strategy is about electrification, that grid upgrades underlie everything okay. that we do. Mm -hmm. um, they are also largely the responsibility of the electric utilities. And I think there was a certain hesitance to go out for federal money and then turn it over to electric utilities to spend in the way that they might spend. 
not really as a state program. Uh, we're not really able to have like, you know, state engineers go out and fix the grid. It's, it's the utility that owns and operates. Um, so, so that was part of why we both recognize the importance, the, the crucial importance of grid mod, but also thought that it might not be a perfect fit for funding for this, mm -hmm. for this measure. Thank you so much. Not at all. Thank you for your very thoughtful questions. Um, so we've talked about like what we're not ordering off of the diner menu. Maybe we can turn to talk about what we are. Um, um I think there was one other question, Lydia, you had right. your hand up. Yeah. I, <laughs> so this is a pretty basic question with this. Does the, is the way that this would work is there's the US EPA, the state applies and has these uh, focuses in mind. And then the, that funding hopefully comes to the state um, with this menu of possible focuses and then cities and towns apply. Mm. Um, let, me, let me clarify, thank you for your question. So <clears throat> we submit this plan March 1st, which is the menu. And then April 1st, the state and cities and towns have a deadline to apply for the implementation grants. And those grants are divided into, I think, five different tiers, ranging from $2 million to $500 million. The total pool of funding available is about $4 billion. And applications within each tier compete against each other. So we are collaborating with a group of New England states to, to for heat pumps in the $500 million tier. If, for example, the city of Boston decided that they also wanted to apply in that tier, we would be competing against each other. Um, and that's okay. You know, the best grant should get funded and all the money's coming into Massachusetts. We have been working cooperatively with the regional planning agencies. We have a pretty good sense of all of the applications that are in the queue. We um, are trying to spread the applications out so that we Massachusetts has applications in every tier, whether they're from a municipality or the state. There's a limit on the number of applications we're allowed to submit. Um, so the state applications will happen in a place. They will happen in a city. They will happen often in partnership with a city. Um, but cities can also apply all by themselves. The state applications, if they're successful, will not really transfer money directly to a city government program. Does that Stay help clarify? Them. Sorry, Jonathan. If I if I if I understand correctly, the state would then Im implement what they apply right. for, um, as opposed to transfer, as opposed to make it make the dollars available to municipalities. But like Jonathan said, municipalities are able to apply on their own, right? Correct. Yes. I have a question extending from that. This is Jen Salinetti. So in this um, particular grant, it's only for municipalities. Is there any requirement or encouragement for partnerships to be occurring with community-based organizations in this, or is it only fun, are the, are the funds only for municipalities to be using independently? For the CPRG, the focus is on municipalities, regional planning agencies or counties and the state. There is not a, a, a uh, and there is a separate competition um, for federally recognized tribes as well. Um, mm -hmm. There is not a carve out for community-based organizations. But Jen, that's course, a really good, good question because we could invite um, for our next meeting. There are other EPA grants that mm -hmm. are, have been recently announced that are pretty significant um, amount of money available to partnerships of um, community-based organizations. Is that right, Jonathan? Absolutely. And um, 
And there have been some recent awards that have been pretty exciting. And we are watching quite closely the Region 1 Tic Tac process. As many of you know, Region 1, because of some confusion that occurred at the University of Connecticut in April of 2023, the other regions of the country have a $50 million funded organization to provide support to CBOs. The Region 1, um, New England, um, that has had to be rebid. And a number of organizations have, have submitted applications. We've been pushing Region 1 EPA to make that award early because we want our CBOs to get that kind of support. And we've been told that would happen in the first quarter of, of 2024. Um, so so there are, there's, there's the Health Resources in Action um, $50 million award. There's the upcoming Tic Tac. And then there's the community change grants that I think Under Secretary Power is referring to, and all of that would be great to talk about um, or bring people to talk about. Can you can you remind me what the name of the grant was for the Health Resources in Action? I forget. Um, thriving communities. That's right, thriving communities. Okay. Um, thank you for that. One other question: Are are these grants reimbursable grants? Um, I'm not sure. I actually I feel as if you're using a term of art. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding what you mean. Are municipalities expected to put up this money up front and then be reimbursed for them? Ah, uh, no. My understanding is that these monies are deposited and then spent down. Okay. Thank you. What is Tic Tac? Ooh, what does that stand That's for? The technical yeah. assistant. It basically is technical assistance, but I don't. It's spelled um, T C T A C, I believe. Y yes, and I don't know what the T C first stands for, um, but it's technical assistance center. The yep. United States is divided up into eleven regions by US EPA. And each one got $50 million to award to a non-for-profit university CBO type entity to provide support to other CBOs to, you know, of an environmental justice nature to in order, in order to help them access the, the IRA, uh, to help them compete for all the other programs. Um, Thank you, Hannah. That's great. Um, and all of the other regions got theirs in April of 2023. And Region 1, um, University of Connecticut put in a winning bid, but then the faculty member who had sort of was leading the charge there up and moved to a different university. And US EPA Region 1 thought that it wasn't viable. And rather than giving the money to the second place finisher, they decided to reopen the competition, which took, as these things do, six or nine months. So we are pushing EPA Region 1 to make this decision quickly so we can have those resources in hand. So I think there's, and Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm getting these confused, but I think there's two thriving communities grants. One is the thriving communities grant making program that Health yes. Resource in Action just got, which is $50 million. Um, and I think that application was um, submitted in, in partnership with ACE, Alternatives for Community and Environment. Um, and then there's this Tic Tac one that was um, chosen for region one, but then um, it had to be Put out again for application, and that hasn't um, that hasn't been announced. Who who is going to get that grant? That one is for technical assistance, um, specifically not not grant making. That's right. So all of that together is there's a lot of activity, and that makes a lot of sense for a future conversation around how to how to leverage all of these federal funds. Um, 
are there any other questions on this piece or do we just spend a couple of minutes on the implementation grants? Okay, if we if we move ahead. Um, so there are three grants that we intend to submit. Um, <clears throat> the um, the three measures that we're planning to put in applications for funding include medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification, offshore wind port investments, and heat pump procurements. We'll talk briefly through the program design of each of these. And we want to hear a little bit of input from you or as much input as we have time for, a lot of input, um, for how these programs should be designed really to maximize benefits for low income and disadvantaged communities. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So this program is designed to provide support for fleets to electrify medium and heavy duty vehicles, class three through eight. So imagine the delivery van all the way up through the tractor trailer. Funding would provide a comprehensive suite of services to fleet operators making their initial investments in electric vehicles incentives, technical support, and infrastructure. We're currently considering the best approach to fully engage low-income and disadvantaged communities, especially communities near ports, warehouses, and other freight distribution centers that experience the most traffic from these vehicles. The idea is to focus on small and medium-sized businesses that have between 10 and 50 vehicles where creating a small electric fleet of two to five vehicles will help persuade the fleet operator that electrification works. Next slide, please. For heat pumps, <clears throat> this is a coalition application of New England states led by the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership to make installing heat pumps and heat pump hot water heaters easy and accessible for contractors and their customers. The program is designed to give a single distributor-based incentive to offer contractors rebates at points of sale and to ensure that those rebates go on to benefit customers. The program will also invest in workforce development and training to teach proper sizing, installation, and selection. And it will also identify have quick start grants to fund state or community-based projects based on the needs identified by a working group involving community-based organizations. Next slide, please. Finally, a coalition with the state of Maine to collaborate on offshore wind growth in the region. This will focus on port development in and around Salem, Massachusetts and Searsport, Maine. Those two points offer strategic access to the enormous offshore wind potential of the Gulf of Maine. That's deeper water than most of the rest of the Eastern seaboard and requires a different kind of port infrastructure to support, to support floating wind turbines. The project will focus on development of port infrastructure with significant workforce development elements in that gateway city for new jobs in the port and offshore. Now, the two, the heat pumps and the offshore wind applications are coalition applications. So for offshore wind, we have we are working with the state of Maine. And for the heat pumps, we are working with five other states. So we have significant influence there, but we are not the only author in those applications. The medium and heavy duty vehicle application is our own, and we have the pen on that entirely. So we're eager for your input. One question that we have in particular around the vehicle incentive application is how we can ensure that let's we're in the range of $100 million of vehicle incentives can go to fleets of vehicles that will actually benefit low income and disadvantaged communities. How do we make sure that those vehicles are the ones that are in fact moving through those communities. Um, that's one of the questions that our team is thinking through in particular, but we're open to any feedback and as many questions as you have. Um, thank you.
Yeah, open, I'll open it up again for questions if folks want to chime in or want to ask um, anything of Jonathan and Diana. Okay. I'm not hearing any questions or seeing any hands. Caroline, you're muted. Sorry, it's just, I was, I was on mute here. You know, I, um, Jonathan, thank you for taking us through that. I was just thinking of your question around uh, making sure that the fleets are getting the, um, you know, the electrification grants are going to the right, the right fleets that are going to the right places. And I wondered whether there may be, and I, I'm not exactly sure if it's, it would kind of, there would probably be some cutoff around the size of the business that would be running that size of the fleet. But, you know, to some extent, maybe in the, in the areas where they're applying, okay, for applying to be a part of this, um, they, they may be able to submit some of the data from various tracking of, of the routes that they normally take or the customers that they're serving, whether they're delivering there or something that may be able to help provide and support the data. Because I, I think you're absolutely right that just because yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of drive through, I suppose that, that, that creates a tremendous number of emissions there. So I, I'm just thinking about how you know, for a business can actually support with data that they are they are where they are and the number of miles and the cumulative emissions that they're kind of leaving behind in um, environmental justice communities. That, that's exactly the kind of data that we are working with our DOT and our vehicle census, our registry of motor vehicles to understand what we have. Um, it's tempting to focus on fleets that are located in particular neighborhoods, but those sometimes spend a lot of time outside of those neighborhoods. And so figuring out what the travel route is and what the home location is, um, is tricky. Um, but thank you for that. I see Ms. Spence has a hand up. So the question becomes, how do I get to the right people? Am I hearing you correctly? That becomes the question. Um, so this is coming personally from me. Someone such as myself would love to see the list you have now. In other words, if you have a list now, um, there are so many more organizations, um, at least when you look in Boston, that are critically looking at businesses of color and have access to different lists of people that are you know, successful entrepreneurs, et cetera. Um, and, and in the category that you're looking at, it could be 20, 30 vehicles you know, for a business. I understand the scale, but where I would start is you know, what list are you working from now? What agency are you working with to develop you know, the right place to go and then see how we can add to it? And there's just a lot of people working on, on this particular subject right now. And there are a lot of places to go that can connect you to yet another place and another entrepreneur. Um, so I, I love that. So that the outreach, the, the program design for the incentive should reflect our outreach network and how we're working with communities, whether it's minority owned flower delivery vans or yep. plumbers or truckers, whatever that is. Yeah. And there are a lot of organizations now. There are a lot of lists out there. And again, I understand the magnitude. It's not everybody. We're looking for uh, a certain level, a certain amount of vehicles and where those vehicles are going. Um, but with, again, love to see the list, bring in some people that can add their lists. And now you've got a good list. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, but I love the fact that the question's being asked. Oftentimes that question is not asked. And I love to get to the correct people for the funding. I always love that process. And then my other question is, you take a fleet, um, you've got a fleet of 30 vehicles. Is there, where are the charging stations? Is it 
you know, is it within, I, it was, is it within that organization of 30 vehicles? Or yes. Is it, is it, okay. The idea is that there'll be a charging station right or, yeah. or more than one. There'll be a couple of vehicles, you know, two, three, five vehicles. They may have a fleet of 20, 30, 50. And the theory of change is that if that business owner for two or three years says, wow, this really works, mm -hmm. then the next vehicle they buy will be electric again. And oh, nice. Nice. that the on their own dime. And that mm -hmm. the reason why people are not choosing electric is because it feels foreign and strange and I need a charger and I can't deal with it and I don't have technical support. So like, let's, let's make it easy for you, do it small, and then you grow it. I get it. Um, the other piece that's exciting about what your first comment was is that it, you know, just behind the scenes, and I'm sure Undersecretary Power sees this, we have like our transportation gurus working on this grant. This will require that group to coordinate with outreach gurus in a way that builds new synapses internally, that's pretty exciting. Thank you. Yeah. I think Peter has his hand up. Yes, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for sharing this as well. And um, I'm reaching back to um, Peter Mate, obviously, um, reaching back to a comment you had made about uh, the challenge of dealing with you know, folks driving from one place to other and isolating uh, the target deployment. And I was wondering what your thought process was around how you're working with the Department of Transportation, um, utilizing data like high traffic congestion, um, air quality metrics, if that's being measured and, um, you know, and engaging adjacent sources of data to help to help triangulate some of these areas that might be hotspots that might deviate slightly from just the areas you're looking at. So transitory hotspots, so to speak. Yeah. Why don't I talk about MassDOT? And Diana, do you want to talk a little bit about CGEST and some of the mapping? and the work that AROP is doing on the health side. Do you want to start with that? Sure. You want me to go first? Yeah, why not? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll i say I love the, the previous comment because um, I think that was Ms. Spence. I think you were just a few paces ahead of us thinking about how to target through our networks and through engaging. And I think the stage that we're at right now is in the mapping process. So. Yes, CGEST was what Jonathan just said is the climate and economic justice screening tool, uh, which is a federal mapping database. Uh, and uh, particularly on transportation, um, the, the database screens uh, exposure to diesel particulate matter, as well as just, uh, I think, proximity to increased transit. So we're actually kind of looking through the database saying, where are uh, where can we look at mapping and say, where is there the highest exposure because of um, both, yeah, light duty passenger vehicle uh, proximity, as well as like dense, um, yeah, like, uh, I guess, inventory or um, why is this word escaping me, but <laughs> ports and places in airports where there's also high truck traffic and and using the mapping tools to actually build that sense of our understanding across the state and then that map uh, we take that and, and, and use that to inform how the program is prioritizing distributing investments kind of spatially uh, with that tool. So that's part of the process. Um, and we're currently working on those maps and getting support from a technical consultant with Arup, um, And that'll be part of the final priority climate action plan. And, and we've done some previous work, um, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Uh, did some work with CalStart, which is an electric vehicle con specialist, around fleets. And, you know, CalStart went and they bought like access for two days to some, you know, for some ungodly amount of money to a database, a commercial database of where all the fleets are. And we have the output of that, a map that shows the concentration of vehicles, of fleet locations across Massachusetts. Um, I'm not allowed to share slides, share my screen, am I? 
think you could be. You can share your screen. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Um, can folks see that map? Yes. Yeah, maybe you could put it in presentation mode at the bottom on the bottom right. Is that a little better? If you yeah. go, go ahead, Castle. Uh, if you go to the bottom right, there's right next to the slider bar. Yeah. Uh, if you click that. Better? Yep. There you go. Okay. So, um, so Peter, we have access to this kind of data, which is helping to inform us on a municipality basis of where to go. We can overlay this with the map of what are the US EPA LIDAC districts um, and identify hot spots that are both LIDAC districts and a high concentration of vehicles. Um, we can also then use the CGES tool to identify the areas with high asthma rates, high particulate emissions. Um, and so you will see that kind of analysis supporting the implementation grant. Great, thank you. Yes. Give you a little bit of the, the flavor of what we're messing around with. Are there other questions or comments from the council, from council members? We will have an opportunity for another um, another comment and question from the public. So maybe, um, Jonathan, I don't know if you can stick around a little bit. Yep, there are. absolutely. Let me just give due credit. Um, as Undersecretary Power knows, the Department of Energy Resources is, those are the gurus who are really pushing, uh, the experts who are really pushing uh, the implementation grants. Um, I wanna give them credit and Under Secretary Power and her team, Crystal Johnson, are leading a lot of the thinking around how we can engage with low income and disadvantaged communities. Uh, this is really a, a cross agency collaboration and we're very grateful um, for that and for all of your engagement. So thank you. No, thank you, Jonathan and um, Diana. So I think we can, um, Updates and announcements. I don't have any big updates and announcements aside from um, our next meeting is again on the second Thursday of the month um, in March, and it will be in Worcester. I hope that we can. Um, it will be a hybrid meeting. This this meeting was um, only virtual because of it was um, just a short notice to 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 figure out the logistics, but. The next one is a regularly scheduled meeting. It will be meeting number 14, um, and it will be hybrid in um, in Worcester. So hopefully folks can, the council members can come in person and we'll try to do outreach in, um, in the Worcester area for community members to come. Um, we did invite uh, MassDEP, Department of Environmental Protection, to go over and share their um, soon to be released regulations on cumulative impact analysis. Um, maybe by then they will be they will be pu uh, made public, um, but any day now. And I don't have any other announcements. Do um, and do council members have any questions on logistics? Doesn't. I don't hear any questions or comments. Um, so now we can move to the second portion of Q and A um, comments and questions and answers where um, what and when appropriate. So Kessel, if you can help me facilitate that, um, so folks can the public um, can raise their hand and Kessel will give you the ability to unmute yourself. And if you would like to write your question in the Q&A box, you can do that as well. And Kessel will 
read it out for us. And we'll take the questions first and then answer the ones that we can um, after the questions, after all the questions um, have been, after all the people have been called or the questions have been read. Um, so Kessel, I'll pass it to you to help us um, facilitate that. Thank you. Uh, for our, I see Julia Thomas has raised their hand. Julia, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I wrote something, so I'm going to read it quick, though, um, but it's a couple paragraphs. So uh, my name is Julia Thomas, and I'm a co-director of the Clean Berkshire Collective, which is a newly formed environmental justice group here in the Berkshires. Um, thanks so much for this very helpful and informative presentation. Jonathan, uh, you mentioned that you have had some meetings with the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, and um, I would be curious to know what they were about. Um, my understanding is that, that, um, that they no longer have financial resources to provide input or oversight on the EPA, GE, Pittsfield, Housatonic River Superfund project, which is the biggest environmental justice and climate crisis in our rural underserved region um, and a county which experiences among the worst health outcomes in the state and the highest levels of premature death by far. My community has uh, severe concerns about the lack of attention that we feel is being given at the state level to the specifics of the cleanup by General Electric um, of millions of cubic yards of toxic PCBs from the Housatonic River, which they dumped for decades in and around Pittsfield. Um, as you may know, in 2020, a settlement agreement was reached by a number of parties, including EPA, GE, the state, and a handful of select board members who voted behind closed doors without any community input, allowing GE to create a local toxic waste dump above an aquifer in the town of Lee for contaminants under a certain threshold rather than ship out all of the contaminated materials or explore any uh, bioremediation technologies. Um, so this planned massive construction project and GE's recent plan uh, submitted to transport most of the contaminated materials relying on diesel trucks will be significant sources of massive of greenhouse gas emissions and will expose already vulnerable communities to hazardous waste and significant mental health stress, which people are already experiencing. Um, these details of the cleanup have favored GE's bottom line over human health and are antithetical to the climate resilience and EJ goals to which the state is committed and we desperately need your help. When the cleanup is over, the dump will be mass DEP's responsibility and it is an environmental crisis in the making, particularly given the fact that it is located at a site previously deemed geologically unsound by the EPA. I'm almost done here. Uh, one concern we have is that some of the very important and valuable environmental justice screening tools like the LIDAC census tract maps and EPA G, uh, EPA's EJ screen are missing critically important data for our region, specifically but not limited to the fact that the entirety of the Housatonic River is a Superfund site, not just the portion that is in Pittsfield. And also the fact that income disparities between full-time residents and second home homeowners in municipalities that will be directly impacted by the cleanup, especially in the towns of Lee and Lenox, obfuscate the fact that there are in fact, they are in fact disadvantaged communities experiencing very high levels of poverty, cancer, and other chronic health issues. Uh, we really need your help. And tonight I would like to know what Mass EJC's position is on the cleanup and how we can work with you with Mass DEP and EPA to turn this whole thing around, um, beginning with a cumulative impact assessment and also a revision to existing screening tools to ensure that they adequately, adequately account for the fact uh, that the communities most impacted by this cleanup are in fact EJ disadvantaged communities. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for your um, your comment and your Thank question. you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, we'll take all questions first. Um, and I would definitely like to follow up, um, Julia, after this meeting. Um, Kessel, do we have other folks with their hands raised? We don't have anyone else with their hands raised, but we do have some comments in the Q&A box that I can read out. Okay. All right, so we have a couple from David Dow. The first one is, oh, and I'd like to apologize in advance if I mispronounce any words. 
I have concerns about the high cost of treating wastewater and on Cape Cod to remove end pollution that is polluting coastal embayments via sewering or innovate slash advanced septic systems. Another comment is, on Cape Cod, we have a grant for free fare for seniors on public transport buses to aid travel for EJ population slash folks who can't drive to shop or go to meetings. A comment from Karen Villandry. Hi, I didn't see much mapped for the greater New Bedford area, which is a large diversified EJ community. Uh, David Dow has a comment that says, Yearling Meadows, where I live, has underground utilities, but we often have power outages due to the above ground power grid structure on our major roadways. Could these be replaced to have underground electricity transmission in this grant program? And another comment from David Dow is, connecting offshore wind to the regional electric grid on the land is a major challenge here in Cape Cod. Angela Panacion, I apologize if I mispronounced your last name, said, this is my first meeting. I'm curious if biodiesel vehicles have also been considered or just electric vehicles. Several of the large DPW slash DOT vehicles are diesel, street sweepers, vac trucks, excavators, clamshell trucks. That conversion to biodiesel seems a better alternative than electric. Uh, next, David Dow commented, the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative has a faith community's environmental network that can Vents climate action dialogue into action on the ground. UUFF SEAC is a member of the FCEN entity. And finally, an anonymous attendee said, What types of entities, for example, public, nonprofit, private, etc., are eligible to apply for CPRG early implementation grants? Thanks, Castle. Um, Great. So and sorry, quickly, I would like to remind all of our speakers to speak slowly so our interpreters can uh, keep up. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the first, I mean, the first one, um, Jonathan, I don't know if you're um, able to, or, or maybe we can follow up with the with this with the commenter after the meeting, but the the um, the Berkshire question. Um, I mean, I would like to follow up with Julia about her comments, um, but just wondering about the Berkshire engagement that has happened. And again, you could we could follow up after the meeting if if that's better. I'm happy to provide a quick response. And first, Julia, I spend as much time as I can in Sheffield, Massachusetts, on the banks of the Housatonic, where my children swim and we canoe. So I'm very aware of the issues around GE out there. Let me say that my conversations with Berkshire Regional Planning Council had to do with the CPRG application focused on greenhouse gas emission reduction opportunities, the building sector needs, and the transportation sector needs more than the local environmental oversight that the GE plant requires. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I don't know if you have, um, there were two two quick ones that I, I noted or that I heard. One was the new Bedford engagement and then, um, and then the diesel vehicles question. Yes. And forgive me, I'm trying to speak slowly and it comes across as stilted and I apologize. My tendency is to speak quickly. In New Bedford, 
we're aware there are environmental justice communities and there are LIDAC census tracts. I want to be clear that the different, there's a significant difference between those two. As I think many council members are aware, the state, the Commonwealth has a broad definition of environmental justice that notably includes language. The federal government does not, it has a narrower definition. And in, in order to achieve an apples to apples level grant application competitive process, we have to use the federal definition. That does not indicate a policy preference on my part, or I think under Secretary Power's part. It is just the language that they make us speak in and the, the maps and the analysis that we have to do. Um, but we have online our priority climate action plan, which has as an appendix, all of the census tracts that qualify as LIDAC together with the municipalities that are attached to them. So there is a complete list online. Um, and if you Google Massachusetts CPRG PCAP, you will get our PCAP or you can contact us and we can share it. As far as the last question, municipalities, regional planning authorities, or state agencies, or other state instrumentalities, such as quasi-public organizations, mass housing, mass CEC, these are the entities that are eligible to apply for the CPRG. My understanding is that the Metropolitan Area Planning Council will submit an application with Boston, Lowell, and I think Lawrence as a part of a focus on federally subsidized public housing electrification. Was uh, the Central Massachusetts Regional Planning Council will do an application, I believe, focused on composting, waste management. The Southeast Regional Planning Council is uncertain of what their application will be at this time. There is interest in forest preservation from Western municipalities and um, municipal building electrification from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, so Pioneer, sort of Northern Pioneer Valley, Northern I-91. And then there are the three applications that we've talked about. That's what I'm aware of, but people aren't required to tell me. That's just the information that we've been gathering. Jonathan, to add to just additionally to that, and for everyone, I did post in the chat the link that Jonathan was referring to. So we'd love any and all public comments uh, through that link uh, to our website and our public comment period is open until February 15th. Uh, and then I did just, thanks for the new Bedford question. I, it surprised me. So I did just pull up our map and that list and uh, there are 21 census tracts in New Bedford that uh, are um, targeted uh, on that list as low income and disadvantaged communities. So yeah, thanks for flagging that. And I think maybe the takeaway is that the map is too small and we will make a more visible tool uh, that we will use um, in the report, but thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Diana. Thank I you, think, Secretary. Yeah, we're getting close to 7.30 and I know we will lose our interpreters um, after 7.30. So I will move us to closing the meeting. Are there any other questions or comments from the council members before we close? Could be about CPRG or any other topic. Great. 
Okay, so we will see you on the second Thursday of the month in March, which is March 14th, second Thursday of the month um, in Worcester, but we will send um, more details soon. And thank you all for joining this special meeting of the EJ Council. And thank you to Jonathan and Diana from the Climate Office for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone.